Ken, great to catch up with you and thanks very much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Cannabis in Medicine, an evidence-based approach was recently published. Can you tell us why this book is so important? Well, it's one of the first um, medical level textbooks that is available for anybody that has an interest in the issue. And it's basically a compilation of several aspects of medicine from, uh, in terms of cannabis and cannabinoids, in terms of basic science, impacts across multiple areas of medicine, including neurology, psychiatry, cancer, pain, emergency room, pediatrics, in utero exposures, driving fatalities and impairment, uh, legal uh, implications for physicians that are working in that arena. Uh, so I think it was very important, very timely. Obviously, uh, being in Colorado, we've had medical marijuana since 2001, and then I was a member of our governor's task force on Amendment 64, which legalized marijuana for recreational use. I uh, participated on the Consumer Safety and Social Issues Work Group, and I spent four years on our state's Medical Marijuana Scientific Advisory Council. But as I was talking to my colleagues many, many years ago, nobody knew anything about cannabis or marijuana and in terms of how it impacts multiple areas of medicine. And that, that was one of the impetuses for me editing this textbook. I have over 70 authors from four countries covering all aspects of uh, the use of cannabis in various uh, aspects of medicine and whether or not it helps and if it does why and if it doesn't help why. So I think it was very timely because in, as you know, in the US, well, we have rampantly expanded our marijuana programs at potentially very high societal costs. The book covers separate fields of medicine why is the book organized this way and what does this tell us about the drug? Well, the, the reason I wanted to organize it in this manner was basically a systems-oriented approach. You have heart, lung, brain, and under brain you have psychiatry, neurology, addiction, and then other aspects of, of medicine, including pain. Uh, interestingly, one of my authors in the pain chapter was an Australian citizen, uh, by the name of Peter Wilson, who got his medical degree in Australia, and then he was on staff at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and has since retired. Uh, but Peter is a wonderful, very smart man uh, and lives in Vancouver, Washington now. Uh, but it, it's it's important that, and, the, and I think the, the point is, and it brings out, that cannabis affects a lot of things across aspects of medicine. I mean, I always remind people we were in the middle of a vaping epidemic, at least here in the US, before COVID hit, where more than 85% of the people that died from vaping devices were either vitamin E acetate or THC, and a lot of these were purchased on the illicit market. Some were purchased in regulated markets, which it should be a red flag and a concern if people are buying things that are supposedly regulated and unfortunately dying or being hospitalized uh, because they were contaminated or, or uh, didn't have what was supposed to be. It's really interesting. We're talking before off camera, uh, and just how how it's changed. I mean, you know, in the eighties and seventies, I suppose sixties, to have pot or weed or gunge or stuff like that, it was it wasn't that that strong. I mean, I think the uh, THC was it uh, was about two percent, and now we have the TH. THC of marijuana, I think it's up around 30 or 40%. Am I right there? Uh, yes and no. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, the TH content was around 2 to 3, maybe 4%. And over time has become more potent and the plant has become modified. And you know, I was actually chastised at a meeting a few years ago uh, by a pro marijuana group because I wasn't recommending God's plant. And my simple response is that God's plant doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the THC content in the plant, in the in the in the plant itself, in the bud flower, is now pushing 30 percent, which years ago they thought would never be possible. Uh, but then you get into the realm of concentrates, and those are on average 40 to 60 percent oh. THC. 
And then you push it even further, and now you have these uh, products that, and I don't know if you've heard of uh, dabs and waxes and shatter, uh, but it looks like it looks like wax. It looks like earwax or very sticky, gooey stuff. And these these products are pushing the 100% THC, purified THC, extremely potent, nearly a thousand times more potent than it was back in the 60s and 70s. And we really are in uncharted waters in terms of what are the very long-term consequences of these products that are readily accessible. Uh, particularly to our young adults and adolescents. I can't understand, I mean, I mean, I understand and I can't understand why, for example, in Colorado it's legal. Um, and I just want, you, you sent some figures through, and I just want to just uh, read some of these figures. Um, prescription opioids increased by 90%, fentanyl increased by 700%, meth by 280%, cocaine by 160% and heroin up by 15%. If they knew that this was going to happen, they must have had some idea that there's going to be all this abuse. Why would they legalise something that was going to do so much damage? Well, a couple of reasons. One, to clarify that those figures are refer to the number of deaths in the state of Colorado since we legalised in 2014 when it was implemented. So in the past six to seven years, yes, the prescription opioid deaths have gone up 90% and fentanyl deaths have gone up 700%, etc. I honestly don't think anybody thought that this was going to be possible to have products as potent as they are. And they don't think anybody was anticipating the amount of people dying in the state of Colorado and dying across the U.S over time because the platform to legalize was well let's substitute opioids with marijuana because it's quote safer um, but it, that hasn't been apparent I mean I sent you the graphic and I'm more than happy mm. for you to share that that we've had medical marijuana since the year 2001 we voted on it in 2000 but we implemented it in 2001 but over time um, especially with the fact that 90 percent of the medical marijuana recommendations are for pain, um, it, we should have the lowest number of drug-related deaths, including prescription opioids. But the counter happened. We've had a significant rise, particularly since legalization. I think the trend was gradually increasing uh, over time. Uh, but I don't think anybody can say where, if they saw the graphic, where expanded use of marijuana for medicinal and recreational purposes has helped Colorado's drug problem. And if you look at the national data in the US, last year we had 82,000 people die of drug overdoses, which is another record in, this, in the United States. And that strongly correlates with more and more states expanding their marijuana programs. I can't say, I can't prove a direct relationship, but it certainly is interesting how strong the correlation is between more states legalizing for marijuana and more people dying of drug overdoses when the, when the mantra and the platform is let's legalize marijuana so we can have people substitute opioids with their marijuana or cannabis but it hasn't been uh, proven and it's not helping the data shows the contrary um, and actually uh, Chelsea Shover and Keith Humphreys from Stanford University in California showed that medical marijuana states actually had a 23 percent higher incidence of opioid overdose deaths so it's not being proven to be an effective pain reliever or an opioid substitute. And actually, the, the Faculty of Pain Medicine from the, um, I think it's the New Zealand and Australian Academy of Anesthetists, um, just had a position statement last week showing that they don't recommend the use of cannabis for chronic non-cancer pain. It just hasn't been proven. Um, all of the data uh, sh that may sh show some support for pain relief and has nothing to do with what people are buying in the dispensaries or the stores. The stuff people are buying in the stores has never been studied. And, and as, as we discussed, the potencies are all over the map. Uh, you can get a, fla a bud flower with 25% THC, a concentrate with 70% THC, or a, some shatter, which is 99% or 100% THC. And that's completely legal in the state of Colorado.
What about age groups, uh, say in Colorado and across the US? Uh, is it concentrated to one particular age group or is it you know, all in? I think it's all in. And, that, and you, know, the, you know, both sides of the debate say they don't want kids to be using marijuana. But this is really and simply Big Tobacco 2.0 when they said it's not addictive. Uh, they didn't want kids smoking cigarettes. But I can tell you, our adolescents are smoking more than they were 20 years ago. And what's more concerning is that the, the use of vaping devices in the state of Colorado increased by 70% in high school age kids just in two years, between 2017 and 2019. Uh, the use of vaping devices, which are and do include higher potency products, uh, went up by 70% in adolescents in Colorado that say they use marijuana. What's even more frightening is, is a lot of the kids, uh, a fairly high percentage of adolescents that are in high school that are using marijuana are dabbing. And dabbing, as I mentioned, are the products that are 80, 85, 90, 100% THC. And again, we don't know what the long-term effects are, are going to be on these young adults long-term in terms of their brain. We don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, I mean, I was thinking about this conversation earlier. You know, not everybody that uses marijuana is going to have a problem. Uh, just like not everybody that uses alcohol has a problem. However, I think there's a very stark difference between um, the impacts and the societal costs of marijuana that we are just only starting to see across Colorado and across the U.S. Uh, this is going to be a significant drain on the healthcare system. Uh, for instance, uh, Sam Wong in Denver published a paper that even before legalization, after uh, commercialization and expansion of medical marijuana across Colorado, they saw a significant uptick in adolescents presenting to the emergency room uh, over time. And 70% of those kids were presenting with a psychiatric illness, either panic disorder, suicide attempts, suicidal behavior, psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, other mental health issues. And I sent you the data that marijuana is the most prevalent substance found when a kid in Colorado kills themselves. It, and that trend used to be alcohol. And it reversed coincidentally and correlates with uh, our voting on legal marijuana. So since 2012, the number one substance found in completed teen suicide in Colorado is no longer alcohol. It's marijuana. So why are these kids dying and having marijuana in their system when nobody wants them to have it. Uh, my feeling is that this is just another uh, group of the population that is being targeted by a very powerful industry for addiction, for profit. Uh, they want lifelong customers. And the data showing very similar to other substance of abuse, substances of abuse is that um, a, a minority of the people are consuming a majority of the product. Uh, that's very consistent with cigarettes and alcohol. When they say, and we talked again about this off camera, when they say it ain't about the money, it is about the money, isn't it? It's totally about the money. I mean, in this day and age of COVID, all we hear over in the U.S. with Dr. Fauci and everybody across the U.S. is with COVID, listen to the doctors, follow the scientists, follow the science, uh, listen to the medical experts. But with with marijuana, all it is is follow the money. Um, and, and as a physician and a scientist, um, I, I think that the science is, is very, very clear uh, that despite the fact that there are components of the plant that may benefit certain medical conditions, there is a mountain of evidence that is creating a significant amount of harm. When I um, was growing up, I had some friends who did some um some interesting things with uh, pot, gunge, weed, marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want. And it was a cool thing to do. And I was, you know, I, I played a lot, of, a lot of sport and stuff, so I wasn't that interested at all. Uh, but those friends of mine who are still partaking of the substance, I have to say they're there, but they're not. And that's one of the long-term effects, isn't it? Absolutely. There's a lot of data coming out, especially from New Zealand. There was one um, that 
that showed there's basically a Peter principle. I mean, if you uh, begin use uh, during early to mid adolescence and you continue to use, you are more likely to have um, poor marital poor marital status, uh, unstable relationships, behavior problems, drug seeking behavior, uh, lower socioeconomic status. Uh, you just are not as successful uh, in the real world. And that has been shown and statistically proven to those that are not using marijuana. You're a pain specialist. Now, there are many claims about how effective marijuana is for the treatment of pain. What evidence exists for this? Now, real evidence. You know, I, I, again, I think there are components of the plant that might be beneficial. And it's very interesting, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of the scientific mumbo jumbo, but I think that when you get down to the molecular level, um, there is evidence on how it may work as a pain reliever. Um, however, in real life, it just hasn't been shown to be effective. Um, and again, stuff that people are, are purchasing in stores hasn't even been studied. So it hasn't even been proven. So I think there's there really is no data that dispensary cannabis is an effective pain reliever. And again, the pain faculty um, for the Australian and New Zealand uh, Society of uh, Anesthetists just last week came out with a position statement that's saying we don't recommend using it for pain because it hasn't been proven. And then that was just mm. after the International Association for the Study of Pain, which is a very large world known pain society, had the same position statement. It, the data to date just does not support its impact and its benefit uh, in pain. Uh, there was actually a very nice Australian study several years ago uh, that followed patients with chronic pain over four years, and they were using you know, opioids, which is a big problem, um, but the use of can cannabinoids didn't show any improvement of their pain uh, and didn't show any improvement of their function. So uh, there was a nice Australian study several years ago that, that showed it didn't help. So there's a mountain of evidence showing that it doesn't help. Uh, I mean, I wish it did, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, we do have a, an opioid problem in our country, at least, and, and I wish there was a better alternative, but I, I certainly support, you know, F, what we have the FDA, the, the, the Federal Drug um, Administration. I support FDA drug development of a purified cannabinoid that helps with pain. I am all for it. I, I'm, I'm all for using something that may help my patients that may be suffering. Uh, but right now, it's, it's a, it's a free-for-all because a lot of times these products are contaminated. I mean, Denver Public Health just had a recall of a product that had cadmium in it, which is a heavy metal and used in batteries. And in October, mm -hmm. they had a recall of a product that had arsenic in it, which is a heavy metal. Um, you know, the Secretary of State of Oregon or audited their marijuana program. And as you know, Oregon has had a very robust medical and recreational program for many years. And they were only able to inspect 3% of their stores for compliance and one third of the growers for compliance. And despite Oregon's robust marijuana programs, the, the state of Oregon's, um, the Secretary of State of Oregon's audit report said, we can't, we can't guarantee that the test results on these products are reliable and they cannot guarantee that the tests, that the products are safe for human consumption. I mean, when you have a state like Oregon that has very, very well, quote, regulated system, and they can only inspect 3% of their stores for compliance, and these products are contaminated very frequently with pesticides and anticoagulant rodenticides and fungicides. For instance, mycobutanol is a very common fungicide that is found and occasionally found on product that is available for purchase. And when you heat mycobutanol in your pipe or your bong, it turns into cyanide. That just cannot be good for the body. And in Colorado, they have a product called butane hash oil, which is it's a, an extraction process to get very high potent marijuana. And in Colorado, despite our efforts to put a cap on the residual amount of butane, which is basically cigarette lighter fluid, uh, a cap on the residual butane in, B, in BHO in the US, we don't have a cap. So if I went to a dispensary uh, in a legal market or in a medical dispensary for a butane hash oil product, I don't know how much butane or cigarette lighter fluid is left in the product and then I'm going to light that and inhale it. That cannot be good for me either. 
So I think it's really about public health and safety because marijuana has failed every single metric of public health and safety in the U.S. so far. What about manufacturing of it? Um, we, we think that it's um, a guy living in the, in the woods with his, a couple of acre plot uh, growing the weed and, um, and then selling it to the shops. But in reality, it's a big business, isn't it? It's huge. Uh, and it's very interesting because this is an industry that prides itself on being natural and herbal and green and medicinal. Mm. Uh, but the, in Colorado, the marijuana industry creates 30% more emissions than the Colorado coal industry. This is not a green, their carbon footprint of this industry is huge. Marijuana's carbon footprint in Colorado is bigger than the coal footprint in the state. That's amazing. People don't know this. This is, what, this is why I do what I do. And if you talk about the environmental impacts, I mean, in California, they're predicting just to, to clean up the mess that they've made in the national forest is about $70 billion. And as a reference point, I don't know if you got, uh, if you heard of the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of, of Mexico mm. several yep. years ago, to clean mm -hmm. that up was only $60 billion. But now they're saying just to clean up California is going to be seventy billion because they are using banned pesticides. They're making they're trashing the national forest. They divert water where salmon don't spawn anymore. Um, there's dead animals everywhere. Uh, the poisons are leaching into the groundwater. They're leaching downstream. The indigenous people rely on growing crops and killing game for their sustenance. And the crops and the game are contaminated with poisons. With the uh, marijuana, it's still regarded as, and even more so than not now because it's legalized, it's regarded as this, this cool product. You know, you've got to have some weed, man. Um, actually, you sound like a president, man. But, but, but you've got to have some weed, you've got to do this. It chills you out, makes you feel really cool. You know, don't, don't drink, that's bad for you. What are some of the greatest myths in public opinion surrounding marijuana use? That it's safe. That's probably the biggest myth, that it's safe. And, and again, generally speaking, anybody that's going to use marijuana is going to be okay. They're not going to get into a car crash. They're not going to become psychotic. And more likely than not, they're not going to become addicted. Uh, but the problem that we're seeing, it has been shown to be unsafe. I mean, our emergency rooms are being filled with patients with what's called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome where you know they're treating their nausea with marijuana but unfortunately the marijuana is causing them to throw up um, and and several years ago it was very very uncommon to see a cannabinoid hyperemesis patient in an emergency room department in the state of colorado now my emergency room medicine colleagues are telling me they are seeing two to three cannabinoid hyperemesis patients per doctor Per shift in one emergency room. I mean, the, 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 the drain on the healthcare system is amazing. And if you take that, it, it costs, the cost of one, of treating one of those patients is about $6,500. And if you do the math, and if you only limit it to one, one of those patients for each of the 25 emergency rooms across the state of Colorado, that's a $59 million healthcare cost. But again, my mm. colleagues are telling me they see two to three of those patients per each doctor, each shift in the emergency department. So the number is probably much, much greater than 59 million. It's probably several hundred million dollar healthcare costs for one diagnosis. Interesting, the, uh, we talk about emergencies, uh, COVID emergency. We talk about, uh, inverted commas here, a climate emergency but we don't hear much about the drug emergency. It, it, and I, again, I talk to people about these sorts of things and I always, always ask, uh, are they fiddling while the US burns? That, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we really, we ha this, is, this, is a, this is another epidemic that is already present. It is not coming. It's already here in the US. Uh, we have kids using, we have kids vaping, we have kids showing marijuana in their system when they kill themselves. We have an increase in uh, marijuana-related driving fatalities. I mean, this is really a very 
broad and deep public health concern. And again, I'll say it again, marijuana has failed every single metric as it relates to public health and safety. I mean, if somebody can send me the data that's showing that our drug deaths are going down, that our car crashes are going down, that our kids are not using marijuana as much anymore, that our kids are not being treated for addiction as much anymore, uh, that it's not being found in the kids that are killing themselves in Colorado, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, fine. But nobody's been able to provide that data for me. And, and, and to be honest with you, with everything that I say, and I'm sure I sound like a nihilist, I hope I'm wrong. I wish I was wrong. Because if I'm wrong, I'll crawl under a rock and disappear and nobody will remember who I am. But if I'm right, and so far for the past over a decade I have been right, we have a public health and safety, I don't want to say disaster, but I say we have an epidemic on our hands. And, and it really is at the, at the expense of our youth. But it's heading towards a disaster. Has the, uh, the beast been released and they can't put the beast back into the cage? No, you can't put the genie, bo you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. Uh, but I think we are, I, I think in Colorado recently we are starting to, or not me, because I've been, I've been publicly speaking on this for over a decade, but the needle is starting to move because I, we have some bills coming down the road about, you know, limiting potency. Because, I mean, the data out of, out of the Europe shows that anything, they, they consider anything high potency more than 10% or more than 12%. And again, that doesn't exist in Colorado. We, uh, the average smoke bud flower in Colorado is 17 to 20%. And again, we talked about the other potency, uh, potencies and other products that are available. Um, but, uh, but I think we're starting to recognize, the state is starting to recognize its, um, it, its uh, poor choices, so to speak. And now they are thinking about introducing bills, uh, capping potency, you know, better education and prevention for youth. Uh, because our, our kids think it's, we've normalized it to the point that they think it's safe and it's herbal and medicinal and they're vaping like crazy and, and it's being, it's showing up in their, in the completed suicides in that, that age group. So we're, we have to put better guardrails on this. I'm all for decriminalization. I don't think anybody should be in jail for having a small amount of weed on their person. Uh, but it, interestingly, in the state of Colorado, I can have two ounces of marijuana and I don't know if you know how much that make that means. Do, do you have do you have an idea of how many joints is in two ounces of marijuana? Uh, no, not really. I, I deal with tea leaves uh, <laughs> when I make a cup of tea, but I, not right. the same thing, is it? No, it's a little different. But they do have they have marijuana teas too. If so, I mean, if you're interested. Um, but two ounce, there's about 28 grams in an ounce, and in Colorado, I, I can carry I can have two ounces of marijuana on my person, um, and if you if you do use simple math of a half a gram per joint. That's, you know, uh, that's 28 grams per ounce. That's 56 joints per ounce. So 112 joints I can have on my person legally in the state of Colorado. That's some party. You could have that's a party, party by yourself. Well, well, it's interesting because in the legal market, I can, I can, have, it, I can have one ounce mm. on my person. But, you know, they don't differentiate between an ounce of flour and an ounce of oil. So an ounce of hash oil, for instance, is the equivalent of 2,800 gummy bears, 2,800 doses of edible cannabis I can carry very discreetly in my pocket with one ounce of concentrate. What about though, if, uh, let's, let's move across to if you're a, a, a user of, of cannabis, um, what about in the workplace? Um, do they still have drug tests? I mean, they used to be very strong on that once. Um, and if you have those drug tests, say if you're dealing with machinery or whatever, or you're a pilot or whatever, but at the same time, it's a legal drug. Is there, is there a compromise or is there a clash of heads there? You know, I, I, think, I think there's clashing of heads. Uh, I think that there, there are some general rules that people that are in safety sensitive positions like long-distance truck drivers, airline pilots, uh, bus drivers, etc., are not allowed to use marijuana in any state that is medicinal or recreational or both, like Colorado. Uh, but I find it very interesting because, for instance, uh, as a physician, if I apply for privileges at a local hospital, um, they don't test me for marijuana. Even though if I am a surgeon, as an example, I would consider opening somebody's body a safety sensitive position. 
but they are not tested for that. And there are some anecdotes of some of my colleagues here in Colorado that use marijuana to, quote, calm their nerves before they go into the operating room. And that, to me, is a frightening, um, a frightening statement if it was true. Would you be Most okay if you, if you had your anesthesiologist and surgeon taking a couple of hits off a of hookah last night of a high concentrate marijuana product, which is legal in the state of Colorado? I would say no. Uh, but that probably does happen in the state because I don't know why the healthcare system for some reason has circumvented the issue of safety sensitive positions and disregarding any provider that may be positive for marijuana on a drug test. The medical profession is sort of like this two-headed beast, isn't it? I mean, I can recall uh, years ago, they would, uh, if you were stressed by any means, you had, the, had um, uh, quaaludes or Valium or whatever the case ne needed to make you more relaxed and chilled. Um, and then it's gone over to, you know, to drugs such as marijuana. The medical profession, it's very contradictory, isn't it? Because on one hand, it says you must not, you follow the science, follow the science, this won't work. And on the other hand, here, t take these, these will make you feel better. I mean, there, there has to be another alternative besides drugs. I, I would agree 100%. And, and I think it's, an, I, I've been so disappointed in my colleagues, to be honest with you. Uh, because, you know, I am a pain physician and people consider that as, oh, you must be pushing drugs and opioids. And, and the answer to that is really no. I mean, in my practice, I try to get people off of their opioids because I'm referral based. And a lot of these patients come to me on en enormous amounts of different medications. And I'm like, where, what am I going to do with you other than try I need to get you off of some of these, these medications? Um, I'm not a big fan of big pharma. I'm not a big fan of big insurance. And I've been very disappointed in the medical community because... When, it, when you talk about marijuana in particular, um, and again, this circles back to the impetus of why I edited this textbook, there's no reference for medical providers on what does the science say in terms of the impacts on the heart. You know, the, the American Heart Association came out with a very nice paper, and the lead author on that paper was one of my authors, Robert Page, who's a pharmacist in Denver, um, and the use of marijuana may increase your risk of sudden death, arrhythmia, uh, heart attack, and stroke. Uh, and, and I think the American Heart Association is, is a well-respected um, well organization. Um, but when the American Heart comes out with a paper saying it could be dangerous to use marijuana, it doesn't get any media because it's not sensational enough. Um, they always talk about how much money they're going to make, and they don't listen to the doctors, and they don't listen to the science. And it's very, very frustrating. And government makes, makes money from, uh, from taxes, from... Uh from cannabis and um, you know, back to the conversation before when they say it ain't about the money, it is about the money. As a doctor and uh, as a person that's been dealing with this for a long, long time, what's a common sense approach for the future? Well, well on that note with, um, with money, I mean, the tobacco industry makes a lot of money. The alcohol industry makes a lot of money. The opioid industry makes a lot of money, but have we done a good job with any of those industries? And the answer, as you know, is no. Uh, the, the data that I read is for every dollar generated in Colorado, it costs four fifty to regulate. I mean, this is just another addiction for profit industry at a huge societal and environmental costs. If somebody wanted to find out more about uh, the, uh, the issues with cannabis, uh, give us a website. Uh, well, number one, you can get my, my book on you can get my book, Cannabis and Medicine, at, on Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably one of the best resources that that the, there is. There was another one that I can't remember off the top of my head that was was very well done. Uh, but but I think that that's what people should really look to is the medical organizations to lead and and the science. And again, I think there are components of the plant that can be helpful. But we need to get rid of these contaminated garbage products that are made in somebody's basement or garage um, and, and give the medical community a purified product that's proven to be effective. For, for example, Epidiolex is a purified CBD uh, that was fast-tracked through the scientists at University of Alabama, Birmingham, Dr. Jersey Slavarski and Tyler Gaston, uh, who were, they actually authored my seizure chapter. Uh, but we have a medicine for seizures that's a pure cannabinoid. 
and I think we should support development of those products for our patients that are proven to be safe and effective. Dr. Kenneth Finn, thank you very much for this illuminating discussion. Uh, a very serious uh, issue that's, in my opinion, that uh, has been around for a long time, but it seems to be ramping up beyond all belief. Thank you very much for your time. You betcha. Thank you for having me.